horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty Hyo Silver, the Lone Ranger. His faithful Indian companion, Toto, the daring and resourceful masked rider of the plains, led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. Nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver. Let's go, big fellow. Are you still there? Away! When a single shot heralded the arrival of wagons at Fort Adams near the Mexican border, it was evident that they had made the journey from Fort Rayburn safely. During the months prior, many trains had been attacked by the outlaw Kyle Ferris and his gang. After the latest arrival, Colonel Palmer, commandant of Fort Adams, was talking to young Lieutenant George Courtney. It's too bad they didn't send us those new rifles from Fort Rayburn on this last shipment. Well, perhaps there would have been an attack if they had. The only time Ferris and his gang seem to go after the wagon trains is when there are guns being carried. You're right, Lieutenant. It's almost as if the outlaws knew when gun shipments are made and by what route they're sent. What about those new rifles, Lieutenant? When is Captain Peacock shipping them from Rayburn? Well, they're on their way here now, Colonel, in Pop Gary's wagon. Uh, what? Captain Peacock is sending a rifle shipment in that battered old wagon that Pop Gary owns? Oh, yes, sir. New gun shipment is a small one. Captain Peacock thinks no outlaws would figure our sending guns like that. Eh, always trying to outguess the outlaws. He and his subtle planning. Lieutenant... Captain Peacock is a brave man, I know that. But I'm beginning to think he lacks good sense. You say the rifles have already left Rayburn? Yes, sir. Huh? Uh, Pop Gary was to set off from the fort three days after we did, sir. He must be halfway here by now. Pop Gary, with a single companion to ride with him, had found the first half of his trip to Fort Adams without incident. Then on a back trail... Kyle Ferris and his outlaw gang attacked the wagon with a hail of bullets. Ferris climbed into the rear of the wagon and found the rifles which had been covered by pots and pans. Yeah, here are the guns. Just like we expected once we knew which way the wagon was heading. That poor captain at Fort Rayburn trying to fool us. <laughs> He'll never learn. That captain will never learn. <laughs> All right, 
Late that night at a remote spot along the Rio Grande, Kyle Ferris and his men crossed into Mexican territory. Before dawn, he transferred the stolen gun shipment to the Mexican outlaw, Ignacio Gonzalez, known in his country as the Hawk. Gonzalez watched the rifles unloaded and looked happily at Ferris. Ah, my friend Kyle, you have done it again. It gives me great satisfaction to pay you gold for this gun. And it gives me satisfaction to get the gold. <laughs> you and your men will be able to do a lot with these rifles, Gonzalez. <laughs> During the next weeks, Gonzalez, the hawk, became the scourge of all Mexico. He and his men, armed with new rifles, attacked estates and towns, and finally a garrison of federal troops. The raid was a success, and the man had become the greatest menace in Mexico. Look what we have done now. Soon we will take bigger garrisons, and who knows? If my friend Kyle continues... I shall be the leader of all Mexico. Then after that, we take back Texas. Oh, the future is bright. Hundreds of miles away, the Lone Ranger and Tonto had entered the state of Texas and were making their way south towards the Rio Grande. We should be near Fort Rayburn within four or five days, Toto. We stop there, Kimasabi? Most gun shipments from the north and east are funneled through that post. Most of the guns that have been lost were shipped from there. We start there? If we're to try and help put an end to the Ferris Gonzalez combination, it's the only place to start. Come on, Silver. Get him up, Scott. Four days later, as the Lone Ranger and Tonto were nearing the hills above Fort Rayburn, a man was dining with Captain Gregory Peacock, the officer in charge of the small post. The visitor was Arturo del Rio, a representative of the Mexican government. As they neared the end of the well-prepared meal, del Rio sighed. Ah, Captain, this indeed has been a most satisfying dinner. Captain Peacock looked at the stern-faced Indian servant who hovered near the table and made a gesture of congratulations with his hands. Well done, Tascosa. You speak to him? Is he not, as you said before, a deaf mute? He is. He neither speaks nor hears. But usually when I make some gesture of approval or congratulations to Tascosa, I find myself using words as well. You say he is an Indian of the Zuni tribe? Yes, my former cook was returning to Mexico and recommended Tascosa as the finest cook he knew. Well, naturally, I was happy to get him. He prepares the most exotic dishes I've ever come across. And he's at the stove from early dawn until late at night. If I have two or 20 persons for dinner, it makes no difference. The next evening, the Lone Ranger and Tonto camped in the hills above Fort Rayburn. At that moment, Captain Peacock sat on the porch of his quarters, finishing outlines for another plan to outwit the gun-stealing outlaws. Arturo Del Rio had helped complete the arrangements, which would go into effect the next day. Del Rio was enthusiastic. One thing is sure. Only you and I know what the plan for tomorrow is. The wagon train of rifles due for delivery here at the fort will not arrive here. Correct, senor. Instead, he'll bypass his place by circling 50 miles southeast of here. Then the wagons will go along the Tex-Mex road to Fort Adams. Now, only you, I, and the officer in charge of the wagon train know about this plan. Excellent, Captain. If something should go wrong this time, it will be easy to learn where... Captain, there is someone over there in the dark. Where? Oh, well, that's only Tascosa. He's like a watchdog, always around me when he's not in the kitchen. A good thing he has not the hearing to know what we have said or the power of speech with which to repeat it. Else there would be four of us who knew the gun shipping plans and not just three. <laughs> well, we have further security as far as Tascosa is concerned. You see, he never leaves these quarters, much less the post. But uh, what was it you started to say, Senor Del Rio? The Lone Ranger and Tonto awakened at dawn next morning. The sun rising in the sky formed a perfect background for the small but picturesque Fort Rayburn in the valley below. Smoke was beginning to pour from the chimney of one small structure, and its spiral upward compelled attention. Tonto, there's something beautiful about smoke like that in the early morning. It's as Jim if I... Eh? Watch, smoke. Watch close. 
Yes, Tonto, I see what you mean. The smoke is going upward in spurts. Long, short, short, long. Those are smoke signals. Not right. They have telegraph instruments in Fort Rayburn. Why do they use smoke signals? Me not know, Kimasabi. It's peculiar. We know the gun shipments are usually lost after they are sent from Fort Rayburn. I wonder if it's possible that someone inside the fort is a traitor. You mean someone send a message about guns by smoke? That was my thought. I think it might set us clear on that point if we go to the fort at once. We'll learn then whether or not there's reason to be suspicious. A short time later, the Lone Ranger and Tonto appeared before the gates of Fort Rayburn. The sentry on duty took one look at the masked man and Indian and reached his own conclusion. Get your hands up, both of you. Corporal of the Guard, post number one. Captain Peacock and the Mexican legate Arturo Del Roy were at the breakfast table when the Corporal of the Guard brought the Lone Ranger and Tonto to the officers' quarters. Captain Peacock and Del Rio leaped to their feet, and the officer looked from the masked man and Indian to the corporal. What's this? Corporal, who are these men? Where'd you find them? They rode up to the gate, sir. Well, we came to see you, Captain. We're not outlaws. My Indian companion and I are trying to help run down the outlaws who've been attacking the wagon trains that leave here. Eh? That's true, sir. We thought we might be able to assist. Uh, Captain, uh, who is it that sends smoke messages from here? Smoke messages? Why, no one. What nonsense is this? The Lone Ranger related how he and Tonto had recognized the smoke signals and concluded... And, Captain, I'm certain they were smoke signals such as Indians use. I'm equally certain, now that I saw your quarters as we were brought here, that the smoke signals came from the chimney of this building. You're insane. There's no Captain, one who... Captain, please hear the stranger through. It's possible he knows something and may be able to help us. If he does not, what does it matter? All you lose is a few minutes while you listen to him. Do not forget your servant, Tascosa, is an Indian. He has been in the kitchen since dawn. That is where the chimney is, Captain. What? Uh, Captain, Tonto and I are sure that the smoke signals came from here. You, Captain, say they didn't. Would you mind, sir, if we asked your servant about them? He's deaf and dumb. We couldn't ask him. I... Well, I'll prove something. Corporal, go into the kitchen. Have Tascosa come here. Yes, sir. I'll prove to this man how absurd his statements are. A few minutes later, the corporal returned to the room leading the Indian, Toscosa. The captain spoke with a note of disdain in his voice to the Lone Ranger. This is my cook and servant, Toscosa. The only one who's been in my kitchen this morning. He's a deaf mute. We exchange ideas in pantomime, using gestures. We use the signs used by the Zuni Indians. And since Toscosa is a Zuni... No, him not Zuni Indian. Me know by clothes him wear and by beads on shirt. Him from Mexican tribe. This is most interesting, Captain. You have told me it was a Mexican who suggested Tascosa for the position he holds with you. I know that. Of course, I know nothing about Indian tribes. I'm from Georgia, and I haven't been here long. But nevertheless... Uh, Captain, uh, did you notice the second button on Tascosa's shirt? No, I should... The captain gasped as he saw Tascosa raise his hand instinctively to finger the button on his shirt. <laughs> He's not deaf, Captain. That little trick of mine proved that. Didn't it, Toscosa? Toscosa? You're able to hear. You gave yourself away by reacting to what this masked man said. I hate to intrude again, Captain. But this Toscosa, he listened to all we said last night about today's gun shipment. I was just thinking of that. It's no secret, Captain, that gun runners have stolen arms from the wagon trains that leave this fort. If this Indian Toscosa had the information about routes and times and conveyed the information to Confederates by smoke signal... That's like... enough. Corporal... Keep watch on Toscosa for a moment. Yes. Stranger, come to the other side of the room, please. You, Senor Del Rio, and I will have some privacy there. I'd like to discuss this matter with you. I'll be glad to, Captain. The curtain falls on the first act of our Lone Ranger adventure. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments.
to continue. Captain Peacock asked the masked man to identify himself. When the Lone Ranger did so by word and documents from law officers whom he had helped in the past, Captain Peacock and Del Rio were greatly impressed. After a brief discussion and with the captain's permission, the Lone Ranger walked over to Tonto. Tascosa could not see the Lone Ranger smile as he spoke low to Tonto. I'm about to try something. Play through with it, huh? Mm-hmm. The Lone Ranger now raised his voice so that everyone in the room might hear his words. Tonto, we have just talked about the case of this spy, Tascosa. Captain Peacock had met men have gone to death because of the messages Tascosa sent to his gun-stealing friends in the past. He agrees with Senor Del Rio and me the justice of having you, another Indian, punish Tascosa by putting him to death. No, no! Um, when we do this, Kimasabi? This moment, here in this room. Ah, me do it. Tascosa's eyes became wide with fright as Tonto approached, knife hand raised high. Suddenly, the Mexican Indian began to speak. No, no, not kill me, please. Not fair to kill. All right, Tonto, that's all. There you are, Captain. Proof that the man is able to talk as well as hear. Yes, and it's all the proof I need to know what you said about the smoke signal is true. Tascosa, you're a spy. There's only one penalty for spies. Death. Please not kill me. Not make me die, please. Senor Capitan, if you let me speak, I tell you everything. Would you care to question him with me, Senor Del Rio? I shall be grateful for the privilege. Then we'll talk to him. What action I take later will depend on the information he gives us. Corporal, take Tascos into the other room. We'll talk with him there. Yes, After talking to Tascosa, Captain Peacock and Arturo Del Rio returned to the main room and told the Lone Ranger what the Indian had revealed. He told us everything. You were right about the smoke signals. He listened to my talk about gun shipments and relayed the information to a lookout in the hills. It was a very simple code they had. Yes, a prearranged code. Simple spurts of smoke from the chimney were all the outlaws needed to know of the plans for shipping guns. After sending Tascosa to the guardhouse, Captain Peacock spoke ruefully to the other men. We were too late to keep him from getting his message to Confederates about tonight's shipment. Kyle Fares probably knows about it by this time. There must be something you can do, Captain. Yes, there is. I'll send a telegraph message to Colonel Palmer at Fort Adams and tell him what happened. It may mean my transfer later, but... Perhaps he will send men from Fort Adams eastward along the Tex-Mex road. I'm going to request that. Meanwhile, I'll take my men south to Tex-Mex and follow the main road west. If and when the outlaws attack, we'll be on both sides of them. This is our great chance to catch Ferris. You'll get both him and Gonzalez if you let me do something. Gonzalez too, you say? Yes. It'll involve the use of soldiers on both sides of the border. But not as openly as you'd planned on this end, Captain. Well, what's your idea? I'd like to hear it. The Lone Ranger outlined a plan to which both men agreed. When he had finished outlining it, Captain Peacock said, You'll be in great danger. But if you get away with it... Hot on, I'll try, Captain. Then count on my help. The Mexican army will be happy to assist you in your plan also. I shall make certain of that within a matter of minutes. Uh, thank you, sir. Captain, if you let me have the letter you promised, I'll take Tonto and we'll set off for the town of Tex-Mex at once. Will the wagon train be there tonight? Yes, I'll give you orders to the lieutenant in charge of the shipment. Then I'll send a telegraph message to Colonel Pop. The Lone Ranger and Tonto took every known shortcut as they rode ceaselessly to the town of Tex-Mex at the east end of the Tex-Mex Trail. They arrived there late in the night. The Lone Ranger, after some interruptions by guards, found himself before Lieutenant Courtney, leader of the train. He gave Lieutenant Courtney, who was dressed in civilian clothes, the letter from Captain Peacock. When Courtney read the lengthy orders, he was puzzled but agreeable. It says here that Colonel Palmer agreed to this. Yes, he did. By telegraph, after Captain Peacock and Senor Del Rio made contact with him. It's what I think you soldiers call a calculated risk. Yeah, but I wouldn't calculate to risk breaking my back like you and Tonto are going to do. You'll be in those wagons covered by those guns for at least an entire day, mister. Yes, I realize that. Just tell your men when they pack the guns on top of us to give us breathing space. Yeah, I'll make them pack the rifles loose around you, too, so you'll be able to move when the time comes. Lieutenant Courtney placed the Lone Ranger and Tonto inside the third wagon. 
The one that would travel in the middle of the five-wagon train. Lieutenant, did you do as I suggested with the rifles? Uh, yes. You'll find there are open crates in the spot where you and Tonda will hide. There are about a hundred rifles in those crates loaded with cartridges. Thanks. I'm sure we'll have to use some of them. The drivers were sworn to secrecy about their human cargo. And shortly after, the five wagons started west along the Tex-Mex Trail in the direction of Fort Adams. <laughs> Kyle Ferris and his outlaws attacked the train late in the afternoon at the most isolated spot along the seldom-traveled road. There was only token resistance by the drivers of the wagons, and Ferris, now that another raid had succeeded, gave orders. Oh, oh, oh. Don't kill the drivers. They were smart enough not to fight back. So just tie them up, gag them, leave them in the bushes. Now we'll cross the Rio after sundown at the spot below Badero. <laughs> A soldier whose task had been to follow the wagon train at a distance found the drivers a short time after the bandits drove off with the wagons. Ho, ho, ho there, ho. The first one he assisted was Lieutenant Take Courtney, off, who in his civilian clothes had driven one of the vehicles. Courtney, released, was jubilant. Uh, thanks. Mass man's plan is working so far. We'll ride over the hill to the telegraph wires, cut in on them, and get a message to Fort Adams. They'll know that Ferris and his gang are crossing the river at Bordero. The Mexican army can pick them up at that spot and follow them. <laughs> Too bad we weren't allowed to take Ferris while we had the chance. When darkness fell, Kyle Ferris and his outlaws guided the five wagons through a shallow crossing and headed southward on Mexican soil. They were on a road that led into the mountains, and as they passed, a man emerged from the underbrush nearby. He was a Mexican soldier, and he ran to where he'd left his horse earlier in the evening, mounted and rode away. Andale! Within a few minutes, he reached the company of Mexican cavalry in the spot where they had been waiting since receiving a telegram from the American Fort Adams. He gave quick instructions. Rip, we are on the trail of Ignacio Gonzalez. Soon we shall be led to his headquarters somewhere in the mountains. We shall receive a signal. And when it is given, we proceed to fight and fight hard. I have given you instructions about not clashing with the Americanos who lead us to the Hawk. So, we ride now. Get ready. Outlaw Gonzalez, the Hawk, laughed happily as his American counterpart, Kyle Ferris, led the stolen covered wagons into the Mexicans' mountain hideaway. Oh, my friend Kyle, you have done it again. This time, even more better. There are guns in all the five wagons. In all five of them. But uh, before we look at them and unload them, let's have some drinks, huh? It's cold here in these mountains. But certainly we drink, my friend. Pancho, Jose, tequila, plenty tequila. We celebrate getting the guns that make Ignacio Gonzalez the leader of all Mexico. At that moment, in the third of the five wagons, the Lone Ranger and Tonto cautiously pushed away the last of the rifles that had been piled loosely over them since leaving the town of Tex-Mex. Tonto, all these guns in the open crates are loaded. They're ready to use them one after the other. Take a rifle and start to fire when I say the word. Uh, the Lone Ranger cautiously lifted the canvas at the side of the wagon. A short distance away, men were gathered around a campfire, and two of them were conspicuously the center of attention. That's Ferris on the left and Gonzalez on the right. They get them first. The rest of this task may be easier. Aim at their gun arms, Toto. You ready? Uh -huh. Then fire and continue to fire. Now! The first shot sent Ferris and Gonzalez to the ground. In a matter of seconds, the gaiety in the outlaws' camp gave way to wild confusion. Men reached for guns, but shots from the wagon train sent many of them to the ground wounded. The others sprawled to the ground and started to fire into the darkness where the wagons were. Then there was a blast of a bugle from the mountain road. Remba, it is the army. Look, they come. Mexican soldiers charged in from the road, shooting. Oh, 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 oh. Surrender. Surrender or you die. Uh, uh, Gonzalez, sergeant, you left that man on the ground. Hey. He's Gonzalez the Hawk. We have finally found him. Remba. Kyle Ferris, though wounded, ran to his horse. His followers, none of whom had been hit, followed and leaped into the saddles of any horses available. Get up there! Come on! Come on. They gave no thought to the fact that no one fired after them as they galloped away toward the north. As they neared the Rio Grande, they heard hoofs approaching on the road behind and shots. 
They galloped faster toward the river, not knowing it was the Lone Ranger and Tonto who pursued them, purposely shooting over the heads of the outlaws. The shock ceased as the American outlaws crossed the shallow river and rode onto Texas soil. Well, boys, we made it. We didn't get paid for the guns, but we're safe. Ho! 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 Yes, sir, we were lucky. They All right, Paris, it. give up. You're surrounded. Hey, the American army's on this side. We're everywhere. Captain Peacock and Lieutenant Courtney led the soldiers who rode in and surrounded Paris and his gang. Two soldiers at the rear of the ranks rode down to the river. One of them led the great white horse Silver, and the other led Scout. Peacock faced Kyle Ferris. You haven't a chance, Ferris. If you reach for a gun... No, no, I'm not reaching. Neither my men. We surrender. I'm wounded. I need a doctor. The outlaw surrendered meekly. Oh. As they did, the Lone Ranger and Tonto crossed the river onto the American side. They dismounted to get astride their own horses. One of the outlaws saw them and spoke. Kyle, those were the armies who rode after shooting. There's only two of them. I thought there was an army. Oh, what's the difference? The army has us here. Yes, thanks to those two men. A masked man is the reason we caught you, Ferris, and the reason the Mexican army captured Gonzalez. What? The masked man, the one who's riding away on the white horse? How could that be? Who is he? Well, when your wound's been treated, we'll tell you everything before you go to prison. Oh. As to who he is, I'll tell you that now. He's the Lone Ranger. This is a feature of The Lone Ranger Incorporated, created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Muir Incorporated, directed by Charles D. Livingston, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of The Lone Ranger is played by Brace Beamer.